Woo! Jack Quigley. That was beautiful. Be kind to ourselves. A pause for the cause. Let's take a deep breath. Hmm. Be fully present in this moment now. Thank you, Jack, for that beautiful song. It's a wonderful time to be kind to ourselves. I invite you all now to remember as much as you can where you were in 1996-ish. Doesn't have to be exact. Although one of the beauty, beauties of writing in a journal is you remember these things because you wrote them down. But generally, where were you in 1996? What was your relationships like, your family life like, your daily life like? What did it feel like, sound like, taste like, smell like? What was your work life like? If we just take that in, 1996. That's 25 years ago. I didn't randomly pick up that now. I was thinking 25 years ago. So that's not that long ago, 25 years, right? 25 years ago, what I know you weren't doing is you weren't checking your emails. What I know you weren't doing was looking at your phone and hearing all the latest news or checking your social media and reading posts or checking your text messages or looking at your phone to get your voicemail no matter where you are. None of that was happening 25 years ago. We didn't know what a miracle that was. If you lived in the 70s, if you can remember the 70s, you didn't even have answering machines. I remember my mother always used to say, if it's important, they'll call back. <laughs> you know, there was no voicemail. There was no call waiting. You, you call, and if someone answered, great. If you got a busy signal or no, you, know, you just have to call back. Wow. Wow, how different that is from today's world, right? So to begin with, a pause for the cause, to taking this moment of breathing, that spaciousness that we heard in the reading this morning, let's begin with compassion. Let's be, begin with compassion for ourselves and our world, the world that we are living in. None of us were prepared that for 25 years we were just going to be continuing to increase the amount of onslaught of information, people wanting to connect with us instantly, in a moment. I know for me, and I know we all have variations according to our jobs and our life, but I get a ton of emails, and I actually opened another email address, and now I have two email addresses overflowing with emails. I. I like being on Facebook. I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those anti-social media because I've lived in so many different places, especially as an adult, different communities, and then as well as my high school. I like to see what people are up to. I like to, to feel that connection without much effort. You know, it's not long conversations. I think we've evolved past that on Facebook, the long, long writing back and forth. We don't want to take, but you just get to see little pictures or see stories that people are interested in. I like that. And with that, I get messages, and I know this isn't just me, through Facebook, through Instagram, through Twitter, text, two email addresses, voicemail. It's constant. The level of connecting and reaching out, and, the, and that I'm supposed to be responding instantly and immediately. And I expect it back, too. I, I recently was trying to connect with someone, and they weren't available. And I thought, well, why aren't they responding to me? Is something wrong with them? Did they? You know, it's like this a sense of... If someone doesn't respond to us quickly, and then, but we're all so completely overwhelmed. Compassion, a pause for the cause. And not only that, then we have constant news stories. I don't know about you, on my phone, I haven't figured out how to change it, I get um, these breaking news, and I've discovered there's no such thing as breaking news, because if it's breaking every hour, it's generally not breaking, and I keep getting the same stories over and over, but it's always breaking news. Notification, you have to read it. And then I thought I turned off those no notifications, but somehow they work their way around and show up on my phone again. So we're constantly getting the intensity of the news. And the news is getting more and more intense, right? You know, just like the world is falling apart. I read a, a, out, a headline just recently, in the last day or two. The Economist magazine, which is a pretty even-keeled magazine, the, the headline was something, basically the scientist was saying 
If we live past 10 years, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> That's quite a headline. <laughs> the hyperbole, the, the intensity of our, our news is like constant. So we are in a world right now, we have COVID virus, we have the bipartisan issues that are constantly reemerging. We have the climate change, we have the violence. It is coming at us 24 seven. And even if you're not reading about it, it is in the energy. Uh, sometimes I'm not aware of what people are commenting on, but I can feel the energy behind it. There's just intensity, a pause for the cause. We didn't have that amount of energy and intention 25 years ago. Compassion, feeling into the presence moment by moment. There is a recent news, uh, maybe I, I know about it, not because I read about it, but because I was reading so many responses to it, what's been happening with Simone Biles in the Olympics. So when she did the Olympic trials, she did a vault that was so difficult and so dangerous that in order to keep other people, other gymnasts from doing it, they didn't give her any extra score for it, for the level of difficulty. So she just did this amazing feat and she got no reward for it. She was also told that she's so far ahead of the other gymnasts that they didn't want the gap to be so big that it felt like there wasn't even a competition anymore. So they did not, they gave her no extra points for this extraordinarily dangerous, difficult vault that she did incredibly well. I was only mildly aware of that, but then on my Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter page, just deluge probably the people that I follow in support of Simone, of Simone Biles. She's an amazing athlete. They would never ask Michael Jordan to stop shooting baskets because he's too good. They would never ask Tom Brady to stop winning Super Bowls because he's so much ahead of everyone that this is, this is unfair and just the, the anger and the frustration at this result. My, my feeling was, as I totally agreed with them. I thought it was unfair, but I was so overwhelmed by the now Simone Biles is the greatest athlete of all time. She's perfect and I saw so many stories about how perfect she was an athlete and it stuck with me because I once did gymnastics and I thought wow this would be horrible to if I were her she must have a mind like a steel trap because if I was her I would I would uh, collapse the the amount of titles headlines that were saying that she was perfect and I'm like going into the Olympics Everyone's saying how perfect you are. There's no room for failure there. There's no, there's no room even to bobble because then you've fallen off this huge pedestal she's put on. So she's getting, on one hand, not rewarded. The other extreme is she's the, the most brilliant athlete that's ever lived, total perfection. She can do no wrong. It just seemed like a setup, but although I just thought she just had this mind, mental, a steel, a mind of steel to be able to withstand that level of being on a pedestal. So when she pulled out, so for those of you who don't know, she pulled out um, for mental health reasons, and clearly this was all getting to her, this level of perfectionism that was expected of her. I didn't know much about the pulling out, but again, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, just deluged with, she's a beacon of, for the, she's wonderful, we support her, she's, She's standing for mental health for all athletes. What a great example she is. And I totally thought what she did was great. But the level of the intensity of the, she's the most amazing, wonderful thing to be taking this mental health, it's to support her. Because I then found out there were some people, there were some athletes and uh, who were saying she should have competed anyways, that she should push through it. And there is that mentality in a lot of athletics. So I don't think it, the, the one report that I saw, it wasn't this, passionate attack. It was, they believe that she should go through it. You can disagree with that, but it was just this level, the intensity. And I think it was, what was impacting me was just the intensity of, yes, we support her, but to continually put somebody on that high a pedestal to everything, every move that she makes, we all love you, we're for you. That's hard. You know, and, and I was thinking about Gwyneth Paltrow, 
who's not someone I know greatly or at all, other than I read an interview that intrigued me. So Sim Sim Simone Biles is 24 years old when Gwyneth Paltrow in 1999 won an Oscar. She was 26. And she was crying a lot in her acceptance speech. And the, in the, what I read, this quote from her was, nobody should get that much attention at such a young age. It was too much. I couldn't take it all in. I was so completely overwhelmed. That's someone in 1999, before social media kicked in. And she was someone who grew up in the Hollywood system. So she was already aware of it. And yet, at the same time, totally overwhelmed her. And it was not something that she thought was a great thing to be 26 and to be winning such a high esteem award. Imagine what Simone Biles is feeling when it's not just 1999 normal media, but everywhere, everywhere. She was everywhere. I wasn't even looking for it. Everywhere I turned, it was about that's, and she's the center of all that. This is the world we're living in where this emotional intensity about Everything is overwhelming. And I think about of all of our spiritual teachers who talk a lot about pulling back. That's the pause for the cause. Pull back. Now, I never, I will say that this is an area of growth for me because I grew up in a family that was very even keeled. My family didn't get really emotionally intense. They just, it's not that they didn't have emotions and got upset or had lots of joy, but. In general, my, they were principled, so they responded to everything with principled. And so I was the emotional one in the family, and I always thought, no, you should have more emotion and feel into it and feel your feelings. But now I'm in, surrounded in a culture that's really getting into their emotions, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, no, this isn't good. <laughs> I got to see my, my own individual way of being mirrored back, and I'm like, this is very unhealthy. I understand much more intimately intimately why spiritual teachers have pushed detachment because when we get so overly emotionally wrought about everything we are in a very unhealthy state mentally emotionally physically a pause for the cause so the way we respond and the what the invitation for this month and always but just to really be with is meditation. You know, in, in a risky business, Tom Cruise has this great line, Porsche, there is no substitute. <laughs> That's my feeling with meditation. Meditation, there is no substitute. Even prayer, prayer is wonderful, but it's just words unless we're actually connecting with the source itself, unless we're actually Feeling and knowing that these aren't just words. The words are fingers pointing at the moon, but they're not the moon itself. The moon, that's why meditation is so important, because it takes us beyond words, beyond concepts, beyond even the form of meditation. Whatever form of meditation you prefer, that will take you to a place that is beyond. And that's the space. That's the pause that we all need and are longing for and hungering for. But there's another part of us that resists it. You know, I don't have, in summertime, we don't have as much routine in our family. When, when we go back to school, the routine comes back in. So I always do my meditation, but in the summertime, it's not at the same time. And it's been interesting to watch myself because I know I'm going to do it. It's not whether I'm going to do it. It's just, I find I put it off. I can spend about an hour putting it off. Oh, I got to do the dishes. Oh, I got to do this one thing. And it's amazing. As much as I know, I love meditating. Or once I'm in that state, it's the sweet spot. It's so beautiful and it's so brilliant. I know that. I've experienced it over and over and over again. And still, my human self resists it to the last, to the very last minute. I'm like, okay, I'm going to meditate now. After I've done one thing after another, I can see myself putting it off and I sit and take my one seat. So just the fact that we know meditation is really important. Just because we can say there is no substitute, that it's this connection. If you're on the spiritual path, that connection is so important. We also have to own that we will find every type of distraction known to humankind, including having fun, 
COVID's, we, we can go out, we have vaccinations, we're visiting, we're doing all this stuff. Those are good reasons not to meditate. We always find, I'm too busy to meditate. I'm too, we have so many th reasons. I'm traveling, I can't meditate. Ten, 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, a pause for the cause. We all need it. We all need it because this world is temporary. The things that were driving us emotionally crazy, we need to pull back. We need to be sitting in that stillness. Yeah, yeah. We need to sit in that stillness and remember to remember who and what we really are that transcends everything that's happening in our immediate personal world as well as in the world out there. So the invitation this month for all of us is to meditate. Take a pause for the cause, and the cause is your spiritual awakening. Your cause is your awakening to the truth of who and what you really are. That's the cause. A pause for the cause. So throughout your day, take a pause for the cause. And I loved our reading today from Eckhart Tolle because it's, he gives a way to take that pause. Just stop and become fully present to whatever's happening. Feel it, feel the texture, notice the sounds, not with judgment. The moment we start getting into judgment, our minds are going. Neutralize, just be with whatever's arising. Try not to invest an emotional attachment. Just be present, just for 10 minutes. If you can just be present, life starts slowing down. Our breathing starts to slow down. That pause becomes a real pause. And the more we do it, the more we start to experience that wonderful spaciousness in life. So how do we respond? So we're meditating, we're connecting, and all this stuff that is happening, how do we respond with wisdom, with grace, with tenderness? I love the way my, I'm gonna talk about the Delta variant right now because that's the immediate news story, at least for these next couple of weeks until another really important news story hits. Or in addition to, because they all seem to be hitting simultaneously sometimes. So the way I learned about how to deal with physical health, I'm talking about physical health now, is uh, from my parents because neither one of them ever got sick or no, I shouldn't say that, they rarely got sick. And the way they both, and I, and I loved it because the way they both dealt with it is very similar to uh, the, this woman, I don't know much about her, she's called the mother, Sri Aurobindo, when he um, gave this running of his ashram, he gave it over to a woman they call the mother. And I so, so resonate with her, but, but people were asking her about healing. And she actually, her answer was very similar to how my parents handle it, so I'm gonna throw it out there which is don't get invested. If you get really sick, then you deal with it. She said, but if you start feeling a cold coming on, you start feeling, rather than say, oh, I feel a cold coming on and you nurture yourself because you're about to get sick or she said, ignore it. And that's how we did it in our family. <laughs> just like, okay, just don't give it all this energy and attention, good or bad. Again, the neutralization, I'm really getting to the power of this. Oh, okay, that's happening, just keep moving. So I saw my parents, they start getting a cold, they start, just keep moving, keep acting as if you're already healthy, and generally, that health habit will just kick in, and you'll return to your health. But what I also saw with my parents is that when they did get the, the uh, I only remember my mom getting the flu once, and I don't ever remember my dad getting the flu, but once in a while, like they had, my dad had hernia surgery, my mom had shoulder surgery. There were various health issues that would come up. But they didn't make a big deal out of it. They just went, they dealt with it, and it was over. It wasn't this emotional gnashing of teeth, the no, 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 no. It was just, okay, just be practical. Just handle it, do what you need to do, go through the healing process, and you're done. I might open up to what's the divine truth of this, what can I get from it, but that's not, we don't wanna have the emotional intensity of I did something wrong. I also had Joel Goldsmith as a teacher, and one of the things he said was, uh, 
common in New Thought was, how did you create this? And he thought that was a silly question. He said, just being human, we are all susceptible to human illnesses. We all have it. We, we're, we're, we're spiritual beings. He was such an incredible healer for people. And he said, but I never think about where did they get disease? They're human. My job is to bring them into a spiritual alignment with who they really are, and those healings start to happen. But it doesn't mean they never happen. He had a heart attack. He was generally very healthy, but he had a heart attack. It's part of human condition. We are all human beings. And part of this journey, the pause, is accepting our humanness, accepting the fact that we are in a very overwhelming time, not only what's happening with our culture, mentally, physically, emotionally, emotionally, but at the same time, we have all this technology coming at us. So we have the, the actual cultural issues that have always happened throughout history, but now we have the added on, you gotta respond now, you gotta respond now, you gotta respond now, you gotta respond now. Just even that energy, can you feel how harsh it is and almost violent? We're living in that as our norm. A pause for the cause, take a step back, be compassionate, love yourself, do not judge yourself, know that we are all in this human experience, experiencing some very intense energy, and we didn't create it, we didn't create the COVID virus or the Delta virus, we're not creating, this is all happening, there's an energy that's greater than any one of us individually, so any part of you that wants to blame yourself, please let that go away. I think one reason why Goldsmith was such an incredible healer is because he never, ever blamed anybody for anything that was happening in their life. He just thought it was a natural part of being a human being. There's a gentleness to that. Bring our attention back to who we really are, but with no judgment, with no blame, neutralize all of that emotional attacking. There's attack and defend, attack and defend. Neutralize spaciousness. And I want to, I can't talk about all of this without bringing in the new thought principles that I sometimes take for granted that we all know, but it's just to remind ourselves what we teach in this teaching, because one of the great values of new thought, Ernest Holmes, what, what we teach, is they were very interested in not just in connecting with this divine presence, a pause for the cause, meditation. But in that connection, from that connection, healing in this world, in this world of time and space, could happen. We were making space. See, all of this is about creating space. We're so tied up, we're so constricted, we don't have space. Create the space. Create the space through meditation. Create space in your life. No new life can come through if you have no space, if you're constantly agitated. Create the space. And one of the things that we know and that we teach, and again, this is a concept, but we wanna go deep into our meditation with things like this, that the divine idea came before our physical body, our emotional body, our mental body, and that divine idea is whole, perfect, and complete. It never has been diseased. It has never been sick. It can never be hurt, harmed, or endangered. It is always whole. It is always abundant. It is infinite. It is eternal. That's your true nature right here and right now. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to fix anything. You, there's just a recognition of what is. So when someone starts to feel sick, whether I do this for myself and I do it for other people, one of the things, we want to differentiate between facts and truth. Facts are about what's, tr what's happening in the human world, in this world of duality. Learning facts, learning the scientific facts, that's all part of living as a human being. And that's, I think, one of the challenges we keep having is that we go either or. We're both. It's a simultaneous experience of both being a spiritual, whole, perfect, and complete being and being a human being. So it's valuable to understand what facts, um, why we, we follow certain facts. I know there's a big war on that right now. I'm not gonna get involved in that. Just saying what the facts are for you and to really allow them to guide you in making healthy decisions. So for instance, we made, we had a, a person who got COVID in our community. So we're taking a two week quarantine. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be this emotional high, oh no. It's just 
So it happens. So we take a quarantine, we go online. It's great. It's fine. It just is. Those are the facts. And so we handle it just like you, if you have this splitting headache, you take a, a med, if you want, some people don't, um, a painkiller and it goes away and then it never comes back. Just take care of it. You don't have to make a big thing about everything. Not you, not that you are, but we don't have to get, just take care of it. So that's what we're doing on the human level. That's the facts. But behind the facts is the spiritual truth of wholeness and perfection where none of that, those facts is never limited by any facts ever. And that's why healings happen that were not expected. That's why things start opening up abundantly, financially, work life, things start changing because we're not responding at the level of appearances. Every spiritual teaching, turn away from appearances, which also means turn away from the facts. Doesn't mean we don't include the facts, but for this time we turn our attention away and we go back into our pause for the cause, into our meditation, and hold that absolute truth because that's what's eternal. That's what's real. That's what's going to last forever. So it is such a gift for any person when they're going through something for everyone to hold the eternal truth about them, to hold that truth for each other, to hold that truth for our community, to hold that truth for the world, to hold that truth for ourselves, that absolute truth, because that's what's creating space for that, those possibilities of healing to burst through into time and space, to burst through into our human experience. And that's what our whole teaching is about, is to hold that space of absolute wholeness and create the space for that so it can burst through into time and space and create a new, new way of being. A habit is broken and a new life is given. And that takes time to pause for the cause. Deep meditation. The people who created new thought didn't just get there because they were just sitting around writing, reading books and writing really cool ideas. Every teacher that I've read about in New Thought, everyone, bar none, spent hours upon hours upon hours in the pause, in the silence. They weren't, they were, they say, including Ernest Holmes, who loved, I just remember him saying, he spent all night contemplating oneness. Well, if you're just contemplating oneness, there's not a lot to say. What he means is he's taking this idea of oneness and just going deeper and deeper and deeper until you're beyond time and space, beyond just the energy body into this incredible causal transcendent realm. A pause for the cause. Everything that we teach, the power of what we teach, it comes from the pause. Everything that we teach about li spiritual living is about the pause, is about that meditation time that we take every single day. That's why there's no substitute for meditation, being still and knowing that I am. From that place, then we can start speaking our word or our prayer, or we speak our prayer to get into that space. It's a both before and after type of thing. Our language and our words are incredibly important, but they're not more important than that which transcends the pause for the cause. And so we want to listen and to be still. When I started working in a psychiatric hospital, it was just a few months after that I started my first class in Centers for Spiritual Living Foundations. And basically I was working in a psychiatric hospital the entire time I went through all my pre-practitioner classes and when I was going through practitioner training. And that's really profound because so much of what we teach is about healing and I was going to a hospital every day practicing all these principles and there were some amazing miracles that happened that I can't explain because I was practicing it all the time the wholeness, the perfection of the patients. And because people are in pain, I'm being asked all the time. It's my daily job to know the truth. And I'm not talking about it to people. I'm, not, I'm just doing the inner work constantly. And that was one of the greatest gifts that I had, is to be able to be studying these principles and working in a place where I got to apply them and, and be confused by them. Mental health is in, you know, when, who's healthy and who's not, and why does it work sometimes, and why, we're, 
why did some amazing miracles happen, but other times they didn't? You know, I was constantly working on this and exploring. I share that because that's what I think this time is the gift for us. Everything. I mean, I don't know. That seemed like a very crazy headline to say um, it's that in 10 years, it might be very likely that we're not here anymore. That's a pretty intense headline, especially coming from The Economist magazine. But it's, there's a gift in it. Climate change, health, COVID, violence, political, incredible intensity with, around the political field, all of it, financial. So we got, we got everything, physically, emotionally, mentally intense. It's like me going to the psychiatric hospital. It's like this incredible curriculum that we are being given as spiritual beings. We have more people on this earth who have been practicing spirituality, I think, than ever before, who have been connecting the walls of divisions that once separated religions are dissolving the spiritual, but not religious, or spiritual and religious. It can be both. That growth is happening so intensely. Those connections, people are meditating, doing their spiritual practices more than ever before, and we're knowing about other people on the other side of the world who are doing it. We are all doing it. To me, we are in this incredible curriculum right now. Where are we going to? Are we going to go with the world? Are we going to go with this world of duality and fall into it and get into emotional reaction over every little thing that's happening and get in the highs and the lows? Or are we going to stand in the midst of it or, or in meditation thoughts? Parlance, take the one seat in the midst of all this emotional stuff and take that pause every single day to let go of the world. Jesus said, let go of everything and follow me. Rather than thinking of that as a lifestyle, think about it when you meditate. Just let go of everything for that pause. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go of all the fear. Let it go of all the attachment. Let it go of all the resistance. Let it go. Practice every day taking a pause of letting everything go and going into that stillness. Because what I find is the divine guidance, what the next step is, starts to automatically emerge when we connect. This presence is always giving of itself. We heard in the Ernest Holmes reading today that spirit already has the solution. It's not in doubt. It's not confused. It's not living in a mystery. It's all right there. I'm getting, as I've been going deeper in my meditations, I'm getting guidance. And I recognize, wow, this guidance actually has been there all along. I was just so not hearing it. And that's so much of what listening is about. The answer is already there. We have to make ourselves available to hear it. And the way we do that is to let everything go over and over and over again and go deeper and deeper into this presence. And the guidance will be there exactly as we need it in every now moment. Not just in the future, not when I've just finished doing this or that, or taking this spiritual course, or now I can meditate for two hours, or not, none of that. Right now, all the answers exist right now, and spirit is infinitely giving of itself in every moment. So not only are the answers available to us, it's being offered to us in love, in boldness, in power. We have to know and believe and accept that and just be still in that pause for the cause. Everything that's happening in our world right now can be a gift for all of us on the spiritual journey because it demands, it has the, that, um, the emotion that we're feeling, that emotional demand is demanding that we go beyond our emotions. When I worked in the hospital, I remember so many, I don't have a great voice, so so many people would say, yeah, don't give up your day job, because I would sing in the hallways. And I didn't do it intentionally. I wasn't aware that I was doing it, except for people kept calling my attention to it. I was in so much joy in the midst of an environment where there was so much pain. But I wasn't in joy because they were in pain. I was in joy because I was so clear that I was there for one reason and one reason only, and that's the divine presence. And I was so intent on practicing it day in and day out. Every hour of the time that I was at the hospital, I knew that God was my employer. 
I didn't even pay attention to him. I don't even know how the hospital ran. I didn't even pay attention. God was my employer. I was there for God. Everything I did was for God. I was in that energy, and there's no way to be constantly bringing our attention, that pause for the cause, over and over again, and not be in a place of joy, regardless of what's happening in the world around you. And in fact, as you start moving into that joy, and as continue, because not that you're not already, but to continue to do that, and you're, the communities start to do that, and we have a the communities all over the planet are creating this sense of regardless of all the things that are falling apart, the world is falling apart, but we're standing in the truth of who and what we are. There's a joy, there's a lightness of being that starts to radiate from all these communities. And that is how we get the healing that in the news and in the facts of the human world seem impossible. That right now in the human world, everything seems impossible. If you, if you actually only believe the facts that you were reading, I, I can imagine being totally depressed and laid out. But those are the facts, they're not the truth. We're here about the truth. Take a pause for the cause. Take a pause for the cause today and every day. Meditate, know the truth of who you are and set yourself free and the people around you will be free as well. Right, Jack? You got it. <laughs> It's so great to, uh, he's doing his spiritual practices every day to be able to bring that in our family life. Standing in the reality of who and what we are. So as we pray in this moment, I invite us all just to take a pause for the cause. There's been a lot of words, a lot of fingers pointing at the moon. Let's just take a moment to breathe let go and be fully present in this now moment. And I will continue to use words, but I invite you to just allow the words to point to something that transcends the words. Be in that wonderful heart space and just feel that presence that is beyond the words. This presence that is in through and as every atom, every cell of all creation, of the billions and billions and billions of planets and galaxies, and dark holes, nebula, the billions of atoms and cells in this beautiful earth on which we inhabit, the grains of sand, the atoms and cells of the leaves of the trees, the water, the drops of water. It is there in the midst of all life that is unfolding breath by breath and minute by minute. We see and feel this divine presence as the absolute reality that even as we feel what's happening in the world around us, to feel the facts of what we are living in the midst of, we go even deeper beyond the facts, beyond the appearances to this one power, this one presence that is right here and right now where it's never in fear it is never limited, it is never hurt, it is never harmed, it is never broken. It is always birthless and deathless, absolute and unchanging, pure, unlimited love. Pure being, pure presence, Pure light, pure peace, perfect health, absolute wholeness. And how grateful I am to know that we are each made in the image and in the likeness of this purity, of this wholeness, of this perfection. that is transcendent of all human existence. 
We are it now. We don't have to make this happen. We are not creating this truth. This truth already exists in all of its fullness right in this moment. We breathe that in. And as we breathe and feel into the space of the eternal now, we call forth with our attentive awareness this wholeness and this perfection in all of our humanity with an incredible, infinite oceanic tenderness and softness, for this human experience is one of great triumph and great sadness. It contains all of it. This transcendent presence can, is big enough and greater than all that is happening in this world, so our hearts are big enough to hold the entire experience of being alive on this planet. All the energy that's swirling around, this transcendence is in the midst of it and transcends it. That means our true self is in the midst of it and transcends it. We just hold our attention to that transcendence to allow it to come gently, softly, tenderly, compassionately into form. We hold any members of our community who are experiencing physical health challenges. We love and support each and every one of them. And one of the ways we show our love and our support is to carry them in the wholeness in our heart and the transcendence of who they really are in that beautiful spiritual plane and care for them in a human plane that needs things that need to be taken care of and addressed. Our hearts, our transcendent spiritual self is big enough and powerful enough to deal with every human experience that we are having in this moment. For ourselves, for the members of our families, for the members of our community, for the members of our nation, for the members of our earth, human members, animal, plant, mineral. Everything is included. We feel all of that, the infinite cosmos in our being. They are safe. The cosmos are safe in our heart because we are pure love. How grateful I am for this time of the pause. How grateful I am to join the Lighthouse community in this pause as well as community, spiritual communities, and individuals all over this planet who are pausing for this beautiful, all-encompassing cause. And deep and abiding gratitude. We give thanks, we give thanks, we give thanks. And we gently, and with a smile on our face, I invite us to say, and so it is. Amen and amen. <laughs>